Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from our gospel lesson, though I'll be referring to all of our lessons. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Back in the late 1960s, I was in junior high. And I had an English teacher there, and her name was Mrs. Hayes. And to be honest, we all thought Mrs. Hayes was just a little bit odd because she really cared about English. <laughs> and of all things, she cared about poetry and memorized whole poems. And let's face it, if you're 12 or 13 and somebody has memorized poems, they had to be a little bit odd, right? I remember her reciting to us the poem, The Spider and the Fly. And she just didn't speak it normally. She animated it so that I cannot hear this poem to this day without Mrs. Hayes popping into my mind. Come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. Tis the prettiest little parlor that ever you did spy. The way into my parlor is up a winding stair, and I've many a curious things to show you when you are there. Oh, no, 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 said the little fly. To ask me is in vain. For who goes up your winding stair can ne'er come down again. If you know the poem and how it progresses, then you know what happens. Through sweet words and flattery and outright lies, the spider seduces the fly until, alas, alas, how very soon this silly little fly, hearing the spider's wily flattery, words slowly came flitting by with buzzing wings she hung aloft then nearer and nearer drew thinking only of her brilliant eyes of green and purple hue thinking only of her crested head and poor foolish thing at last up jumped the spider and fiercely held her fast he dragged her up those winding stairs into his dismal den within his little parlor. But she ne'er came out again. How it does not leave the reader without the moral of the story. And now, dear little children, who may this story hear, to idly to idle, silly, flattering words, I pray you ne'er give ear. And to, unto an evil counselor, close heart and ear and eyes, and take a lesson from this tale of the spider and the fly. I have to say, Howitt, who wrote the poem, does an excellent job of describing <coughs> temptation as well as the results of temptation, of giving in to temptation. It reflects what the apostle or, or the evangelist James wrote, but each person is tempted when he is allured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Temptation comes to us from three sources, the world, our sinful nature, and the evil one himself. And I suppose ultimately you could say it all comes from the devil, for if Satan had not succeeded in the garden, then we would have no sinful nature to worry about. And the world which fell at the same time that humanity fell would not have fell, fallen. And therefore the world would not be luring us to depart from the ways of God as well. But Satan did succeed, 
and the fall did happen. And we heard the culmination of that in our reading from Genesis just a moment or so ago. So now we all share the plight of the psalmist, who, which he applies to all and which we chanted earlier. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who could stand? The answer to his rhetorical question is, of course, no one. It is as the Apostle Paul wrote, I mean the Apostle John wrote, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Paul wrote, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. O Lord, if you should mark iniquity, who could stand? In our reading from Mark today, Jesus depicts Satan as a strong man. The goods that the strong man has is discovered from the context of the reading. Jesus is among people teaching and helping them in various ways. They are the good. So Satan is depicted as having humanity in its grasp. The record of human history reveals just how strong a grasp Satan has. But the stronger man is Jesus, who binds the strong man and plunders his goods. So you and I are plunders of Jesus. This binding is foretold, again, we go back to our Genesis reading earlier. Uh, it's foretold in that reading. When God speaks to Adam and Eve of a promised seed who will crush Satan. That promised seed is Jesus. He bound the devil, to use the image from Jesus in our gospel lesson, on the cross. If we were to use the image from Genesis, then Jesus crushed the Satan, Satan on the cross, crushed the head of Satan on the cross. And if this image, by the way, which finds its way into our stations of the cross, which are in the hallway there. And if you look at them as you leave today, you will note that there is a serpent in all of them. And in most of them, it is either biting the heel of Jesus or its head is being crushed by the cross, reflecting that Genesis 3.15 prophecy. The tools of the evil one remain consistent throughout the <coughs> ages. He calls evil good, and good, evil. So in the garden, Adam and Eve are called to abandon God's good word for something else. God said, don't do this. They reject his command and choose their own path. Calling good, evil, and evil, good. In our gospel lesson, <coughs> Jesus is accused of being in league with Beelzebub. Again, calling good evil. And by contrast, of course, evil would have to be good. <clears throat> we see the same thing throughout history and in our country today. That which God clearly identifies as evil is exalted as good. The Nazis in the days of World War II, you know, Germany, that sort of stuff, caught on to this technique, and they called it the big lie. The idea is to repeat a falsehood, the bigger the better, so often that it begins to be assumed as truth. That's how they convinced everybody that the Jews were responsible for all that had ever gone wrong in Germany. They just said it over and over and over and over and over until it seemed to be true. It happens in our country today. And I could give all sorts of examples, but uh, this one, uh, you know, is the exaltation of sexual sin. Uh, homosexuality, sex outside of marriage, so forth and so on. It's getting hammered so much that, for example, if somebody says, I got a divorce, 
we don't even bat an eye today, do we? What would have happened 75 years ago? Oh, let's get out the scarlet A's. But you just hammer something <laughs> so much that all of a sudden <coughs> seems to be normal and okay. The big lie. How it's advice is to not listen to the big lie, but to be honest, left to ourselves, we always will. We'll always bite. We'll always fall for it. We would be like the fly, slowly coming closer and closer to the spider. We need outside help. No fly, no matter how big or strong or whatever, will come out victorious against the spider. And this is where Howitt's poem fails us. She would direct us to our own resources, but our resources are just too limited. If I were to rephrase Jesus' parable in terms of the spider and the fly poem, he would say, no fly can enter a spider's parlor and plunder his possessions. Someone stronger than the spider must first crush the spider, and then the flies can fly free. Instead of teaching us to simply not attend to the evil counselors, Jesus would turn our eyes on him and his word. It is not enough to stop our ears against Satan, the world, and our sinful nature. We must fill our <coughs> eyes, our ears, our hearts with Jesus and his word. A Christian's strength does not come from within him, but from without. Whenever somebody says, rely on your heart, they are telling you to rely on your weakness, not your strength. Jesus, his atoning death, and those means he has given us to connect us to his death, the word and the sacraments, is where our strength is, outside of us. Paul tells us something in our epistle that really does not come as any surprise. He writes to our writes of our outer self as wasting away. What he is talking about is twofold. First, we get older, we get sick, our eyesight fails, and so forth. We're wasting away. Our physical bodies are simply and inevitably breaking down. The other aspect of wasting away is from persecution. If you endure the <coughs> lash for the sake of Christ, it has physical consequences. If you are imprisoned for the sake of Christ, the imprisonment has an impact on our body. So whether from natural aging or from persecution, our bodies are wasting away. No surprise. Anybody never figure that out? You'd have to be pretty young to not know that one. He also refers to this by speaking of our light momentary affliction. Again, this might be the results of something natural like illness or the loss of sight or strength or something like that. However, if wasting away is primarily referring to that sort of a thing, physical uh, infirmities or whatever, uh, light momentarily affliction is referring primarily to persecution for the faith. Now, each age seems to produce its own particular persecutors. Currently, of course, probably the radical Muslims would jump into our minds as the main culprits in persecuting Christianity. However, as I was growing up, and as many of you were growing up, how often did you hear about the godless communists? Right? And they were big persecutors of Christianity. Religion in, in general they don't like, but specifically they despised Christianity. And Christians were sent off to Siberia or executed on a regular basis. 
By the way, the Lutheran Church is alive and well and growing gangbusters in Siberia because that's where they all got sent. <laughs> you know? But before the USSR was around, the Nazis persecuted Christianity. If you weren't willing to conform to their national church, which was not a church, you paid the price by either uh, concentration camps or execution. And before them, the Ottoman Turks. And these are just examples from the West and from the 20th century. If you were to go to the website Voice of the Martyrs, you would find other persecutors in other parts of the world. And if you go to earlier generations, you find persecution from uh, just about any source that is not Christian. But in spite of the effects of aging and sickness and the like, as well as the attacks of evil or the evil one against Christ and his body through persecution that we find in the world, Paul tells us we do not lose heart. These things are light momentary afflictions. Now, it may not feel that way when we're going through them, but in the scales of eternity, they certainly are fleeting. So Paul points us to the eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. The afflictions of this world are the things that are seen. Our heavenly splendor is part of the things that are unseen. With that view in mind, we are encouraged to endure our current trials in hope. That hope is found in the one who crushed the spider, who crushed Satan when he died on the cross and rose three days later. Death was not able to hold Jesus. It is into that victorious death that we were baptized, as Paul told the Romans, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? This is not a sim simply a symbolic ritual, but a real sacramental union through which we died to sin and were raised to new life in Jesus. In our baptismal with Jesus, union with Jesus, we defeated Satan. Therefore, we do not lose hope. In the Lord's Supper, that sacramental union is strengthened. In that sacred meal, we receive, as he said, his body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed for us. We receive them, as he said, for the forgiveness of our sins. And as Luther said in his small catechism, where there is forgiveness of sins, there is life and salvation. In the sacrament of the altar, we also find then the stronger one, our Lord Jesus, who defeated the strong one. So we do not lose hope. Jesus also comes to us in his word. As Jesus said, his word makes us clean. The word of God is living and active. It is called the word of life the word of truth, the sword of the spirit, and many other wonderful things. Through it, we are confirmed in the truth and ready to face our light momentary affliction without losing hope. Our hope is in Christ, and the word and the sacraments keep us well connected to him. All other ground is sinking sand. So when we are tempted, lured, or enticed to enter the spider's parlor, we indeed do not give credence to those lying lips, but we do not find the strength to resist from within. We look outside ourselves to the one who has faced the spider and crushed him, to the one who is the stronger man, to the one who has who was promised long ago to Adam and Eve and who came to win our victory, to the one who has prepared for us heavenly dwelling places, 
to the one who comes to the church through word and sacrament, to our Lord Jesus Christ. In him we do not lose hope. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.